Thank you for that beautiful worship. Well, I was born and raised in Northern Ireland. And in Ireland, they had this strange educational system. At the age of 11, you had to pick your career path. At 11, every child had to take what we called the 11 plus exam. And if you passed that exam, you went into high school, which was the university track. If you failed, you went into secondary school, which was the trade and working trade track. Just the name high school and secondary school give me the impression that the 11 plus exam was the separating of the sheep and the goats, as it were. My three siblings all passed the 11 plus and went into the university track. Unfortunately, I failed and went into secondary school. And because of my siblings, the, the principal somehow bent the rules a bit and said, we're going to give you an opportunity to go into the high school, the university track. I only lasted for two days. And I returned to my friends in secondary school, which was much more fun. I've always lived in the shadow of my older brother, William. He was so smart, he graduated from high school, went into second year university, and won the top award. I guess my way of compensating was to make soccer or football, as we called it, my career path. Now let me ask you a personal question. What was it like growing up in your family? How did you get along with your siblings? What expectations were placed on you because of your brothers and your sisters? Well, this morning, just for a few moments, I want us to consider two disciples who were brothers, who were also followers of Jesus. Most of us know Peter, but Peter had a younger brother called Andrew. And can you imagine what it must have been like for young Andrew being the brother of Peter. Peter, the older brother with the, the type A personality. Peter was a person of action. He was the disciple who had the claim to fame of at least attempting uh, to walk on water. Peter talked first and thought after the fact. He was the first to confess being a follower of Jesus and the first to deny knowing Jesus. Peter is mentioned 96 times in the Gospels, while his little brother Andrew, he's only mentioned 13 times. You know, having a brother like Peter must have been quite the challenge for little brother Andrew. And maybe you can relate to Andrew, always playing the, the second fiddle, as it were, to a more outgoing, gregarious sibling. In such cases, it's easy for people like Andrew to withdraw into their shell or the shadows, or maybe like I did, try to find my self-esteem in something that would draw attention away from the poster boy brother or sister. And for a few moments, I just want you to consider a few of the, the characteristics that we find in regards to Andrew. John 1, 35 to 40 says, The next day, John was there again with two disciples, and when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying. And they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Christ, that is the, the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. 
Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which translated as Peter. Now, we know that both Peter and Andrew were fishermen, and I'm sure they worked hard and diligent in their profession. But you see, Andrew had another passion. Andrew had a passion to seek God's presence. I find it interesting to see that before Andrew became a follower of Jesus, he was a disciple of John the Baptist. You see, Andrew had this passion for God. And when he wasn't fishing, he was on this spiritual journey of exploration. And when John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, look, the Lamb of God, Andrew immediately knew he had to meet this Jesus. And what a day that must have been for Andrew, just sitting in the presence of Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah. What an important lesson, I believe, for you and me. You know, so often in our search for truth, we end up debating theological issues. Instead, I think we can learn from Andrew, who had this passion to seek truth by dwelling in the presence of Jesus. But secondly, I want you to see Andrew had a passion for bringing people to Jesus. Look what Andrew did next. After spending the day with Jesus, he went straight to his big brother, Peter. And I can just sense the excitement on Andrew's voice. Hey, bro, we found the Messiah, and I just spent the whole day in his presence. You just got to come and meet him. And Peter meets his Savior, and as they say, the rest is history. He became the great preacher on the day of Pentecost. But my friends, it wouldn't have happened if Andrew had not brought Peter to Jesus. Look at another example. It says in John 12, now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship in the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee with the quest. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Yes, these Greeks were there, but they had no one to introduce them to Jesus. And isn't it interesting who Philip turns to? It's not Peter. No, it says quiet, more reserved Andrew. He, has, he is the one who has this longing to bring people into the presence of his Messiah, Jesus. Someone has said the most effective way for people to come to Christ is through existing relationships. My friends, I believe what God desires of each of us is that we have this passion, which we see in Andrew, to build trusting relationships in our neighborhoods, in our place of work, where we can introduce people to Jesus and to experience that relationship which will radically transform their lives. You see, Andrew was living out the call of Jesus. I will make you fishers of men. But finally, Peter had a passion, a passion to meet the practical needs of people. Most of us love to read the story of how Jesus fed the 5,000. We know the key persons in the story are Jesus and the little boy. But few of us realize it was Andrew who brought that little boy to Jesus. Listen to what it says. Philip answered, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke, here is a little boy with five loaves and two fish. Do you notice what Andrew does? He brings even the little resource he has discovered, and he puts it into the hands of the master. You see, Andrew isn't concerned about bringing attention to himself or becoming a miracle worker. No, he has learned this profound lesson. If we offer up the little that we have to Jesus, we will see what amazing things can happen. You know, one of the blessings of directing the Tim Center, we don't have a lot of resources, but the little resources that God gives us and that we give back to him 
We have seen amazing results when we hand over the little that we have to Jesus. I wonder, are you and I looking for even the little things that we can place into the hands of Jesus for his kingdom? Yes, Andrew was so different than Peter, but God used him because he had a a passion for the presence of God. He had a passion to, to bring people to meet his master, Jesus. And he had a passion to give even the little he had into the service of the kingdom. In the few minutes we have left, I just want to mention a few things about Peter, the bigger brother. One commentator refers to Peter as the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth. You know, his name is always listed first when the disciples are mentioned. Peter's name is mentioned in the Gospels more than any other disciple. No one speaks as often as Peter, and no one is spoken to by the Lord as often as Peter. No disciple is so frequently rebuked by the Lord as Peter, and no disciple ever rebukes the Lord except Peter. No one ever confessed the Lord more boldly, yet no disciple ever denied Christ as forcibly and publicly. Here's a few of the characteristics that I think when I think of Peter. He's impulsive, he's bold, he's a risk-taker, and he's a lifelong learner. You know, when Jesus asked Peter to become a disciple and a fisher of men, he saw, I believe, a diamond in the rough. Behind that rough, tough exterior, Jesus saw a leader in the making. You know, so many of the stories of Peter take place by the Sea of Galilee. As a fisherman, Peter was an expert of living and working on the Sea of Galilee. Yet, as we'll see, it is the carpenter Jesus who will teach Peter the fisherman some important lessons by the Sea of Galilee. Well, we know this story so well. Jesus had just fed the 5,000, and he told the disciples to go in the boat and cross the Sea of Galilee, where he would meet them on the other side. And partway across, a great storm comes up. Now, if you read the story carefully, it doesn't say the disciples were afraid of the storm. After all, these were hardened fishermen. They had experienced many a storm. But listen to what it says. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. If it's you, Peter replied, then tell me to come on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Just a few brief observations. Like I said, these hardened fishermen had seen many a storm, but they'd never seen anyone walk on water, even on a calm day. No wonder they were terrified and thought they had seen a ghost. Now, when we think of this story, at least I did, I always thought of Peter being impulsive and just jumping out of the boat. But that's not what happened. You see, after Jesus had said those assuring words, take courage at his eye, don't be afraid. Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come in the water. What is Peter thinking? He has never walked on water. He knows that this is not humanly possible. How can he be so dumb? The only answer I can give is that Peter is convinced that if this really is Jesus, the one who fed the 5,000, he can also empower him to do the impossible. I try to picture the scene as Peter throws his leg out over the boat, and as he looked back at the disciples, I've often wondered what were they thinking or doing? Are they cheering? Way to go, Pete. You're the man, Pete. Go walk on water, big guy. 
Just do it. I don't think so. I imagine them saying to Peter, Peter, what the heck are you doing? What are you trying to to prove, Peter? Jesus is here. There's no need to get your feet wet. Just stay with us. Well, you know the story. Jesus says one word, come. And the most amazing thing happens. Peter walks on water towards Jesus. The disciples, they're dumbfounded. And no doubt Jesus encourages Peter one step at a time. Then in a moment, Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and he begins to sink and he cries out, Lord, save me. And that was all what was needed for Jesus to reach out and to pull him up. You would have thought Jesus would have given him a little pat on the back and said, well done, Peter, great try. Wow, you showed those guys in the boat. Instead, Jesus, he gives him a kindly rebuke. He says, you have little faith. Well, I think, in fact, Jesus was saying to Peter, if only you had kept your eyes on me, Peter, you could have gone the whole way. Now, my friends, what lesson do we learn from this story? There are many, but the one that comes to me is this. Jesus encourages you and I, as he did Peter, to take risks in life. He could have told Peter, just stay in the boat and be safe, Peter. Let me do the walking on water. But instead, it is Jesus who encouraged Peter to be a risk taker. And so I asked you, are you willing to take risks? I don't mean being reckless. Risk is more about not being in control of the outcome. Taking risks are difficult because we all dislike the feeling of failure. But did Peter fail? I don't think so. Let me share two brief examples of of two people who took risks. One, his name is Jonas Salk. He attempted 200 unsuccessful attempts to make a, a vaccine for polio before he came up with the one that worked. Someone asked him, Jonas, how did it feel to fail 200 times to try to invent a polio vaccine? His response was, I never failed 200 times at anything in my life. My family taught me never to use that word. I simply discovered 200 ways how not to make a vaccine for polio. Someone asked the great Winston Churchill, what most prepared you to lead Great Britain through World War II? Churchill responded, I think it was the time I repeated a class in grade school. The questioner was shocked. He says, you mean, Churchill, you flunked a grade? Churchill replied, I never flunked anything in my life. I was simply given the second opportunity to get it right. My friends, when is the last time you have been willing to get out of the safety of your boat, to give the outcomes over to Jesus? When Jesus met Peter and Andrew that day along the shores of Galilee, he said, come and I will make you fishers of men. And they were willing to take the risk of leaving a secure livelihood and to follow Jesus. I could tell you stories of my own life, of leaving Ireland by myself, of going to Africa to work as a missionary. Time will not allow. But God could be saying to you, it's time for you to get out of the safety of whatever boat you're clinging to. Our final story is found in Luke 5. Jesus had been teaching by the shores of Galilee. He was using Peter's boat as a pulpit. And after his teaching, he told Peter to go out into the deep and throw his nets overboard. It sounds very simple and straightforward, but it wasn't. For Peter, it was a ridiculous request. Here is a carpenter telling a fisherman how to fish, and everyone knows you don't catch fish during the day. You catch them at night with your lanterns. Peter had spent all night fishing and had caught nothing. Now he's being told to do something that went against all reason for a real fisherman. But I love, I love what Peter said. It says, Master, we have worked hard all night and have caught nothing. But because you say, 
I will let down the nets. Now, what is Jesus trying to teach Peter and you through this story and myself? You see, if Peter had to put down the nets at night, the logical time to catch fish, it would have all been so normal and so predictable. It would have been Peter, the experienced fisherman, doing what he knows best, catching fish. But to do it in broad daylight, this was unheard of from a fisherman's perspective. Why not save your energy and go back out at night, the proper time to catch fish? Now, this is why I said one of the characteristics of Peter is he's a lifelong learner. And Jesus was saying to Peter, and he's saying to you and me today, I am the teacher. You are the student. Are you willing to learn how to be a fisher of men? Then you have to see it's not by human logic or man-made abilities. Fishing for men is a supernatural endeavor. You see, the the great lesson of this story is not so much the big catch of fish in broad daylight. No, it is rather that this bullheaded Peter was willing to say, I'll throw out my nets even if it defies everything I have been taught. In closing, you remember after three years, Jesus was at Caesarea Philippi. And he asked the disciples, he said to them, who do men say that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, always the first to speak, he said, you are the Christ. Was that the right answer? I think it was. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Then Jesus began to teach that he must go to Jerusalem and die. Do you remember what Peter does? He has the nerve to take Jesus aside and rebuke him. Maybe he said something like, Jesus, Messiahs don't die. That's a contradiction to everything I've been taught. The Messiah is supposed to go to Jerusalem, become a king, and overthrow the Romans. Jesus, let's get the storyline straight. And Scripture says, Jesus looked at Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Jesus was saying, if you hold on to that safe yet glorious view of the Messiah, then you're actually playing into the hands of the evil one. If you're going to be my disciple and follow me, it must be the way of the cross. For Messiahs do die. It may not make sense, but it is the true storyline. You see, the lesson of casting nets in daylight, was teaching Peter for this very moment. Jesus was saying to Peter, and he says to you and me, can you give up your preconceived ideas and follow me even when it doesn't make sense to you? Don't try to dictate the outcomes from your human perspective. When I say come, then take the risk of getting out of the boat and walk on water. When I say cast the nets, then cast the nets. When I say, take up your cross and follow me, then take up your cross and follow me. No matter what you think or what other people might say. Yes, Andrew and Peter were so different in personalities and abilities, yet they were both equally used by God in powerful ways. Why? Because they were willing to obey and to follow Jesus, whatever the challenge. And they trusted Jesus with the outcomes. And my friends, notice what the outcomes were. After calming the storm, the disciples worshiped Jesus, saying, truly you are the Son of God. After the great catch of fish, Peter fell on his knees to worship, saying, go away from me, for I'm a sinful man. And after the cross, the doubter Thomas worshiped and said, Lord and my God. Friends, may that be true of you and me. In following Jesus, even when it doesn't make sense, we will see his glory and worship him for who he is. Let's bow in prayer. Can we just stand for our closing prayer? Father God, thank you that you make us unique. Lord, help us to be like Andrew, with a passion to seek your presence, to bring people to meet you, and to even give the little that he had to you. And Lord, help us to learn from Peter 
to step out of the security of whatever boat we're, we're finding and clinging to rather than taking those risks. And Father, help us also to be like Peter, to trust you, even though it may not mean sense to us. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.